Well, I'd like to um, thank uh, Sister Huda for giving this um, nice overview um, of um, uh, her reading of women and, and men's roles in, in the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, and I'd like to look at things a little bit uh, from a different perspective this evening uh, to try to put things in a bit of a comparative context to identify some of the major areas for uh, where we need to, to work a little harder, where we need to think about um, how to implement some of the ideals that we hold, some of the areas where we're doing better than others, some areas where we're not doing so well, and try to suggest some, um, some strategies uh, uh, for working together, or at least strategies for thinking um, uh, a little more deeply about how to solve some of the inconsistencies that we see uh, between our, our beliefs and our practice. First of all, I, I would begin as a Muslim by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Muhammadan abdu rasuluh. So I begin by praising God and by witnessing that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. And um, I do this, I begin by praising God to identify myself in this university first as a Muslim. And what I'm saying is that the reason why I'm saying that is that. I'm speaking to you from a religious framework. And that's something that I need to have a right to do, even when I'm speaking in an academic uh, context. Now, that may seem obvious to you. Uh, to others, it may seem uncomfortable. Having spent, having um, studied my PhD at the University of Chicago, I know that many people believe that there is a neutral discourse that's stripped of religion, which is a secular discourse, and that's the proper discourse to use, speaking rationally, speaking about issues. Uh, I believe that, that neutrality is a fiction, and that people of faith should not have to reduce their language, strip their language always of God and to somehow justify everything in materialistic terms. At the same time, Muslims need to realize that the goal of Islamic law, according to religious scholars, is not simply to get people to the afterlife. That's the ultimate goal. But how, is that, how does that happen? That happens through a life process. And if our lives are not shaped in a way that is fair and just, if our experience in this life and in this society is not a positive experience, there's a very good chance that we will not become the kind of grateful people of faith who will feel that close relationship with God. In fact, if the society in which we live is unjust and unfair, and in particular, if, if the injustice is done in the name of religion, probably people will be driven away from religion. So that it is the, I, it is not in my hands if anyone gets into paradise. It's not in my hands if anyone is guided. But what is in my hands are the day-to-day -day things and the institutional things as a member of society to try to make this a fair, just, good society in which people will develop their natural tendency to be grateful, to recognize God, and that is what true faith is. It's gratitude, it's shukr. The Quran talks about it being thankfulness. The opposite, the word that means unbelief literally means being ungrateful. So Muslim scholars have always recognized that, that, the, that Islamic law has to be oriented around preserving five main goals. The first goal is to preserve religion, but the other things are life, property, family, and mind. And so that means that as Muslims, we have to be very concerned about the implementation of our, our ideals, whether it's working or not working. Because if it's not working, and then and there's a gap between our theory and our reality, then 
people are going to be turned away from religion. And that happens, and we won't have been fulfilling our goals. So the person who has faith is the one who is a realist, the one who has wide open eyes, looks at problems, acknowledges them, and tries to solve them, because that's the, our responsibility here on Earth. Now, one of the things I, I want to talk about at first is just what some of the apparent problems um, with uh, the application of Islamic law or Islamic morality to uh, the lives of women. Talk about some of those apparent problems and see whether they really are or not. The first thing that, that I notice is that we have a real problem in communication <clears throat> between Muslims and non-Muslims often or between observers of Islamic society and participants of Islamic society because of the incredible um, emphasis put on visibility and visuality in modern society. And this is something that is really unprecedented e even in the West. Although the West has a long tradition of emphasizing uh, visual knowledge of things. So for example, we see that portraiture and Western art emphasizes the individual and portraying the individual in their image. So statues, paintings, and of course, the three most popular uh, subjects for portraiture are women, beautiful women, deities, so gods, religious pictures of, of uh, uh, Jesus and saints and people, uh, other major Christian figures, and then political leaders. Um, to, and so all of these things emphasize a different thing. The, the pictures, the religious pictures emphasize uh, a certain view or image of God and God's place in the world. The pictures of women, you know, very rarely did you have pictures of, of women who were very well dressed. Usually it was women's sexuality, uh, their voluptuousness, their sensuality. With men, it was their greatness and power. You know, Islam forbade uh, the creation of any of these kinds of images. We were supposed to know God in a different way. We were supposed to know women. Men were supposed to know women in a different way. And we were supposed to relate to our leaders and the greatness of our leaders in a different way. And one of the, so I think that what happens is that we come to put an emphasis in the West on visuality and think that being seen means being known. Or seeing someone or seeing something, seeing that person, a depiction of that person means that you know them. So we see pictures of movie stars and famous people and, and people have a sense, you know, in popular culture that they know that person. Whereas it's extremely superficial. What do we know about them? Islamic society looks at a different, looks at things differently. And you should know people by their actions and what they do. And I want to give you an example. I, I do not believe that uh, covering the face is required in Islamic law, but there are people who believe that, that uh, Islamic law requires women to cover their face. I lived in, in uh, Pakistan for a year when I worked in an Afghan refugee camp, and because um, you know, Af Afghan society is very conservative, especially among the kind of village people who were living in the camps, most women needed to, um, to cover their face and their whole bodies. Now, I remember one day, I remember hearing my husband when I first met him speaking about this one woman. Her name was uh, Umm Muhammad. And he, he spoke about her so many times about this great woman who was very smart. She used to, uh, she was a scholar about how smart she was and all the different things that she said. He was telling me about all of the good work that she did working with orphans and running these camps. And I didn't meet. She was covering her face, totally. And I realized that my husband had never seen her. And what was interesting to me was that he had such a complete picture of who this woman was. He had so much respect for her, yet he had never seen her. And that's something that I think is very difficult for people coming from a Western perspective to understand, because we think that being covered means being invisible. 